Hello everybody. Today I am indulging in a little bit of what my German friends might call Ostalgie. That is a fascination with all things from the communist era. Today I am driving, for the first time ever, a Wartburg or as it should probably be called, a Wartburg. And in this episode, I'm going to tell you about what exactly this car is, who built it, what it was for, and why on earth anybody would want one now. time in power, the Soviet Union created a whole variety of different vehicles, some of which were designed for all of their many citizens and businesses, some of which were aimed at specific territories, and others which were even exported to Western customers. For my UK viewers, the car of this type they're most likely to be familiar with is the Lada, on account of the fact it was actually sold here for quite a while, pitched essentially as a budget alternative to every other car, and recently I have had a chance to sample a larger and though it certainly had its quirks I did enjoy it for what it was and today I am very keen to visit another jewel from the east in the form of this. The other car of this type that people tend to be familiar with is the Trabi aka the Trabant the East German people's car and this was actually built and aimed at much the same market but a slightly different customer. The Wartburg is a product of Eisenach in what is today the middle of modern Germany, but then would have been the southwest corner of East Germany. It sits in the region of Thuringia, and I must confess, I know little to nothing about it other than the fact they produce some darn good sausages. Thuringia Bratwurst are some of my absolute favourites, and if you ever find yourself in Germany and there's a hot sausage stall, and if you are in Germany, a hot sausage stall will never be far away, do yourself a favour and try a Thuringia. Hopefully, you'll not be disappointed. Anyway, let's stop talking about sausages, shall we, and get back to the important business of cars. So then, what was the key difference between this and a Trabant? Well, essentially, it was the customer that the car was aimed at. Bear in mind, due to the nature of the communist regime, buying a car wasn't a process that really happened anything like it does today. And not only would you wait an incredibly long time to get one, up to about 10 years, you wouldn't necessarily have all that much choice in what it was that you got either. The theory, I suppose, being that the government would give you the car appropriate to your needs, and if it wasn't the one you'd asked for, you'd be thankful that you'd got anything as opposed to nothing. What we have here today is a Wartburg 1.3, an extremely short-lived car that was in production from only 1988 until 1991. Rather unfortunate timing, as just a year after its introduction, the Berlin Wall began to come down, as did the rest of the Soviet Union. And so, by 91, the factory was purchased by Opel, and this car very, very quickly became a distant memory. During this time, the chief customers for it were many of the then still Soviet states, and this particular one was delivered new to a customer in Hungary. Then finally, finding its way to Britain in around 2018, and then last year being acquired by Mick. Fundamentally, this car is an evolution of the earlier Wartburg 353, which was introduced way back in 1966 and was actually based on a design that DKW had from 1938, but due to unfortunate events that happened soon after, were never able to put into production. Just in case the DKW name is one that you've kind of heard of but can't quite place, they are one of the four rings that form the Auto Union, aka the Audi badge today, which was Audi, DKW, Horch and Vandera. Knowledge that one day I'm sure may become somewhat useful to you if ever you attend an extraordinarily anoraki pub quiz. At first glance, this was simply a facelift of the old 353. In fact, quite a bit was changed. The chassis was fundamentally similar, retaining double wishbone, independent suspension at the front, and an independent trailing arm setup at the back. The car is also of body-on-frame construction, so though it's not super light at around about a ton, it was still relatively durable, being designed essentially for the rather treacherous roads that plagued the Eastern Bloc. 
the interior was given an overhaul and odd little bits aside like the fact the door handles are these little round bits here you pull out and then backwards and the fact there's just about nothing in here it doesn't really feel all that bad for a 1980s low budget car it's fine the big news though, and the reason this car is called the 1.3, can be found up front, where out went the original engine, a three-cylinder two-stroke, and in came a new 1.3-litre four-cylinder four-stroke, which many people apparently say is that from a Polo, but in fact is not the case. Though it may have a distant relative in the Polo engine of the day, and certain parts, like apparently the head, are definitely similar, if not the same, there are also quite a few key differences, mostly in the bottom end, where, if nothing else, you'll find the mountings completely different, because the Polo of the time was already a unibody car, and this was not. So the way it connects to the chassis is totally different. To put that engine in was also a very, very tricky job, because the VW original just wouldn't fit and so in order to accommodate it essentially the whole car was redesigned from the a pillar forwards with a considerably wider track and a larger engine bay to accommodate all the new stuff including the Wartburg designed and made four speed manual gearbox allegedly the endeavor of redesigning the entire car to accommodate this engine actually wound up costing more than the four stroke engine that Wartburg themselves had proposed way back in the 1970s it makes around 58 horsepower, meaning it's not exactly sprightly, though I do have to give it some credit because, compared with many of the other Eastern cars that I've driven, this really does feel rather well put together. Now, granted, I'm doing about 40 to 45 mile an hour right now and can sense I am at the edge of its performance, but it's actually a reasonably refined thing. It is fairly comfortable, though I am told after about three hours, as uh, Mick has kindly driven it down today, you do get a little bit tired of it. This four-speed gearbox actually works fairly well. The car definitely picks up as you work through the rev range, and as you might imagine, it doesn't have a rev counter, but you do get the feeling when it wants to change, and if you are cruising, about 50 to 55 is, generally speaking, its happy place. Though much of this car is standard, there are a few things which are not, including the fact it has the front bumper from a 1.3S, which essentially means it's got fog lights, and it has been lowered, partly because the original suspension is comically tall to deal with all of the imperfect road surfaces it was designed for, and also to improve the handling. In further pursuit of that goal, it also sits on a set of wheels that are original but have been widened from about four and a half inches to around six, meaning the car can now wear some slightly wider and also lower profile tyres. This means, I'm told, it is much, much better behaved in the corners, but even so, this is not really the sort of car that I'm tempted to throw around all that much. Sorry, it is damp. It is greasy, it is a little treacherous out there today, and in terms of driver aids, well, it doesn't have any. There is no ABS, there is no traction control, there is certainly no stability control, there isn't even a brake servo. Though impressively, up front you do have a pair of disc brakes with four piston calipers, and at the back, a pair of drums. Although, in truth be told, that lack of assistance, including any form of power steering, just isn't an issue. And for somebody thinking of their first classic car who wants something a little bit different, I think this would be a good shout. Visibility, naturally, is excellent because all of the pillars are paper thin. This makes the fact that I'm on the wrong side of the car really not much of an issue at all. It is also something of a TARDIS, this. Though in pictures in isolation it probably looks like a fairly big car, actually it's not. It's about that much longer, I think, than a modern day Fiesta. But inside, you will fit four adults in relative comfort, and the boot is enormous. I was messaging my girlfriend last night, and she was asking what I was up to today. She's off visiting family, and I said, I'm filming a Wartburg. And she said, what on earth is that? So I sent her a picture, and her response was, that looks like the sort of thing that should be tailing somebody in a Cold War spy film. And she's right. 
I think this is exactly the sort of thing that you'd have found tailing you if you're in East Germany up to no good back in the 1960s. In fact, apparently these days, much of the population of Wartburgs here in Britain is made up of cars that have been imported by movie production companies who use them as props. They redo them so they look like an old-fashioned police car of the day. And though I know there are a lot of people out there who probably have a bit of a fascination with the older two-stroke cars, the fact is this is so, so much more civilised. A Trabant or something is an absolute riot for about an hour, but you very, very quickly tire of it, and I couldn't imagine doing a long journey in one of those. In one of these, it's still not going to be a particularly pleasant experience, but I think you could do it with a bit more ease. Certainly if you've got kids and the like, this is much quieter inside and naturally doesn't smell quite as weird. In fact, and I don't know if this is actually true or not, but I'd like it to be, the original 353 with its two-stroke earned the nickname amongst its owners of Farty Hands. <laughs> Come on, Farty Hands, to the shops! <laughs> In comparison to the last larder that I drove, it also feels generally quite well screwed together. Everything in here seems to work, not that there's actually much to work. Oh, it does have an air horn though. Should we try that? Yeah, let's try that. I'm gonna get past the animal sanctuary first <laughs> before I turn the musical horn on, but uh, it's not often I get to play with these things. Right, okay, yeah, there's nothing out there today. So uh, this is the standard horn, which is actually pretty loud, quite effective. That would definitely clear any ne'er-do-wells out of your way. Then I think if I press this button here, there's two unlabeled buttons, one of which tests that you've still got brake fluid, and the other... <laughs> oh, no! <laughs> oh, I mean... I would be missing a massive trick if I didn't use that to do a 1960s Batman-style transition to a drive-by shop. So, here we go. Days like today actually also feel like they're somewhat tailor-made for this car. As you might imagine, there is no air conditioning. It is 11 degrees out there and the um, cooling fan isn't set to full, but it's on. And I'm getting a little bit of a breeze through here, but not too much. This car also comes with, though not currently fitted, the same little trellis thing for the rear window that I see in many larders and the like. That's a handy little feature, that. And honestly, it's just got a, a lovely personality about it, this car. I just... I like it, it's interesting, and even in the rarefied company of Trabant's larders and the like, this is a little bit different. It's very pleasant. And apparently it's also not warm enough. The temperature is now yellow. It was green earlier, now it's gone yellow. I must not be driving it hard enough. Or it's run out of water. Well, you can't even rev match. Heel and toe, never gonna happen. Pedal placement would just simply not allow it. But, you know, it's a decent thing. I like it. Steering feel is good. I mean, it's wobbly and it's all over the place and all that, but again, nowhere near as much as, say, the last larder I drove, and it's... I don't feel like I'm holding up other traffic too much, even though I know that I probably am. The speedo, I've been told, is definitely, definitely optimistic, and even if it wasn't, still not going that quick. But I don't mind, because I'm enjoying myself, and I could definitely see this as the sort of car that you take out every now and again to go for a picnic to an interesting car show that sort of stuff i wouldn't want a daily one honestly because it's too dangerous but that aside though i really really like this so then fancy yourself a slice of the wartburg life what are you going to pay to get into one well that's a bit tricky really because they are really really rare of this 1.3 which was granted quite short-lived mick reckons there might only be about 20 in the country 
And should you want to know a little bit more about them in general, or this one specifically, check out his YouTube channel, which I think is Mechanics Garage. I'll put a link in the description down below. The 353 is a little more commonplace, and that car was actually sold here under the name the Wartburg Knight. So in case it is slightly familiar to you, or you think Grandad used to have one, there is a chance that they did, but they were fairly short-lived, they were discontinued here in about 1974, the importer gave up on it and decided instead to back some other brand called Mazda, which ultimately probably turned out to be a better decision. So the tricky bit really is not necessarily what you're going to pay for one of these, but actually getting your hands on one full stop. And the good news is, if you did, you aren't going to be paying all that much money. I'm told the absolute best of the best of the best, which probably doesn't exist in Britain, would be like £4,000. But you can pick up a going concern for about a grand. Mick also then bought a second one to use as a spares car. And if you think that's cruel, well, the fact is that car was simply too far gone. It was not salvageable. It had a sunroof and there is a design flaw with them that when the drain channels block up, which they will, it then just pours water into the rest of the chassis and rusts from the inside out. So it was totally gone, but still had some good spare. So he's used it to keep this one going, which I think is probably the right thing to do. In other parts of the world, they are more commonplace and you can still get bits for them, but they're likely not quite as easy as some other cars of its type. I actually think when it comes to something like this, it's in the spirit of the machine to simply maintain it however you can best and with whatever parts you have available to you, because that's likely how a lot of people did it when they were still new. The indicators work, the wash wipe actually works fairly well, the gearbox provided you don't push it down, because if you do push it down, you're apparently definitely going to find reverse is fine and it's a pleasant thing. You can tell there isn't much noise insulation because I could hear that motorbike very clearly. Anyway, there's a little bit about a car that you don't really see much on. I hope you have enjoyed it and I want to say a big thank you to Mick for bringing it out. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already and I'll see you for the next one. Bye bye.